Okay, we have a couple items on the agenda. Let's see who's here. So is Aleph on the line? Hello. Yo, what's good? So the homework from last week for Aleph was to look at different types of metadata that she could use in her NFT offering. It was kind of like an experimental thought process that we had at the last session. And I was just compiling my thoughts around how we can start this primitive space for metaverse, thinking that metaverse is going to be a near but also external reflection of our social ecosystem that even causes us to start to encapsulate individuality. So the project idea is that I would like to produce this primitive metaverse concept. This map will be treated as an extension layer of social conduct. Well, I want to hear more details about how the map works. A map is an existing Web2 technology, uh, like Google Maps is, for example, built the metaverse on top of it. You're thinking um, like a visual type map from the exactly. physical world. Ah. Exactly. I'm more like a visual person. Mm -hmm. But it reflects the social world. I try to give some like use cases for different business ideas uh, in my proposal instead of just going technically uh, more time towards technical. One thing that I would like to, you know, baseline my NFT, you know, metadata is location primitives. We've got some ideas and now we're, I feel like we're reaching to connect to something. The thing with a serial number, what is it connected to? Are you storing coordinates? Is that one of the data types since it's a, a, a real map? Yep. That was one of the answers. Can you can you stack the coordinates? Like if someone uses the same coordinate as you, is that allowed? And also could the coordinates be like an entire chunk of, let's say, a country? Or is there a limit to how much of the map you're able to consume for one NFT? Right. Also, is it, why are we assuming a 2D plane, right? We can have infinite dimensions. I don't think we should go about like infinite dimensions. Maybe up to 3D would be nice. That is actually offered in maps functionality right now. It's existing functionality that is offered in maps. Great. Everybody knows the earth. Nobody owns the earth. We can allow people to plant flags wherever they feel like. If it's a metaverse, who owns the metaverse? There's not an answer to that. Who owns the DNS system? The, D the registrar. A 2D metaverse that some people have in their minds versus Facebook versus the DNS system and other technology that we have today. Maybe you're going to hit some contradictions. Who is authorized to give out these coordinates if they're exclusive? Why can't I just take all the good space? I also want to point you to episode number three, where we looked at Area NFT. This website's dead, but you can find it on web.archive.org. And this project actually did take the earth and they were selling all the different pieces of it. And then the question for 37 was how large are the pieces? They used subdividable pieces. Piece could be subdivided into smaller pieces. There is a technology for this. It's called Google Plus Codes. But if you just type anything into Google Maps, hairdresser, New York, all the addresses, plus codes. That's what this thing is right here. This is the technology that area.world was based on. These are the basically the sizes that they were selling uh, like this. Bridgeport, New Jersey or wherever. And um, so I refer you to that to check it out. Uh, this is definitely something other people have been thinking about. How do we sell the earth? For metaverse, maybe it's a new earth. Maybe it's like Minecraft. Minecraft is not one-to-one -one map to earth. There is no canonical Iceland in Minecraft. Well, and importantly, you can have infinite Icelands in Minecraft yes. if you want. Can we meet in the middle, like in terms of Minecraft and also earth-like structure? to better create this theater economy and make more inclusive parallel space for everyone. You've got to decide. As the product designer, you have to have all the answers. And so the question is, is this on Earth or is this not on Earth? That's a major question. Question two is, if I own this space, can anybody else own the same space? Those are major questions. And does Iceland have any say? Because it is their country after all. I was going to say, um, before the NFT ban on Minecraft, I did create like the smart contract that lets you claim chunks. The reasoning for it was it would be a free-for-all in the world. Anyone could do anything. But if you own the chunk, it would at least be protected so that no one can vandalize it. And I made it so that it's unique. And I also made a chunk limit for it. You can't just claim like the entire world. You have a limit to what chunk you can claim. And if you wanted larger spaces, of course, you could just buy more chunks. That's, that's completely up to you. But no other person can then claim that same chunk. So they're exclusive ownership. They're exclusive, exactly, yeah. And that was just to prevent like things like vandalism. Why don't we try to modify the land 
with with future forecasts with existing existing land with a future forecast for example let's say that we are going to build new skyscraper or whatever we want to build why don't we just make this space more like a topology uses use as a topology and modify that in a more futuristic way create that empty, maybe auctions i don't see a clear answer here that ties into the product I've seen free for alls where land has been given out, and in every case, the project has failed because there weren't enough people that were interested in just claiming land, even if the land included major cities. So it's really got to be secondary to a, a bigger thing. Why does there have to be ownership of land? Yep. So that's this question, too. Is it exclusive? Doesn't have to be exclusive. If you look at Instagram as a land grab, you're like, what? Or Foursquare where you're always looking at the map, but Instagram, you're looking at the pictures. Well, the data structure is the same. When you post on Instagram, there's a location. There is a map view somewhere of Instagram. They're not exclusive. Nobody even thinks of it as exclusive. Could this be problematic if you wanted to render this 3D space and then there's like a cluster of stuff in one spot? Then it would be like really hard to see stuff if it's like all clustered together and like morphed. You got a Statue of Liberty. Uh, when you use Google Maps, you know you can drag the little guy to the street, right? And you can see the street. You can also drag it to a camera. When you do that, it pulls in photos. It used to pull in photos for specific locations that it, I have no idea where these photos came from. It's called panorama. Here, oh, these dots right here, here you go. This is a specific photo taken at this location. There's gonna be more photos around the Statue of Liberty in New York than there is you know, somewhere random in Brooklyn, let alone Kentucky. You might even zoom in here and not find any panoramas in this little lake right here. And you can just find them again by dragging this little guy. So there's no blue dots here. There's nothing panorama. And you, oh, here's one. I had to walk around a little bit and I found one right inside a oil change and filter place for 1995. You know, this is different levels of detail. There's more people in a crowded spot. You just have to zoom in. Now the thing about Google Maps and the way this works is you can just keep zooming in. You don't zoom in on Minecraft. There's a specific size of things in Minecraft. The reason why it works in Google's Maps is because these are points. So all of these panoramas and things are a specific point and you can just keep zooming in. It's like Craigslist too. So I'm gonna look for camera. And the way it works is when you have a lot of detail in Philadelphia, you just get this big circle called 304. But when you zoom in, it splits out. So now in Center City, and it's gonna zoom in to kind of break out those 110. Now I'm in South Philly, now I'm in kind of like South Broad, and you zoom in until you can actually see stuff that you want to see. And this one happens to be 22 different things in one location. So it wouldn't let me zoom in anymore. Somebody's selling a lot of iPhone 11s. So these are different ways that you can handle dimensionality and self-similar structures or fractals. I like the ladder idea better, the clusters. For me, Minecraft is an amazing game, but it's super tutorial, don't you think so? Right. Super object oriented. We want kind of abstraction too. That's an extension of reality that we are trying to create. It's called metaverse, right? It's my definition. I don't know. Not super territorial, but also inclusive. So I have some answers for you, Elif. The technical question from last time was, how do we connect the NFT to this metadata? And so I, I took a couple screenshots. I wanted to show it to you. I actually went through this. These are fresh screenshots. I used Manifold. I've heard a lot of great things. I've used it. What is, what is Manifold? It is a tool to create a smart contract for your NFT. And it's a, like a no-code NFT creation UI? Yep. Is Manifold a platform that you might be able to try to implement your extension to ERC721 that you've been working on? Yep. So after I would deploy that, I would probably make a PR to Manifold. And if they are amenable to it, they would add a checkbox that supports this. Uh, let me show you here. So there's a button. The website is called manifold.xyz. It's called Manifold Studio is the product. Just a few clicks, I was able to create a smart contract, an ERC721, also known as NFT, and I was able to deploy it on Gourley Testnet. I didn't have to choose too many things, and then I clicked go. It took a few minutes to go through on the network. The network's a little slow that day, and it went through. Then the next thing is you get to mint tokens. Now, the cool thing about Manifold is you're not paying 2.5% to sell your tokens. If you're gonna sell them on OpenSea, they're looking for 2.5% coming and going. Bah. These guys are charging 0%, so good times. When you're creating an NFT, you can add properties. One of them was a latitude longitude. So I typed in a property as a number called latitude. I typed in a property called number as a longitude. 
And then I typed in a property called location, which is a latitude and a longitude. Just to compare them differently, the documentation for manifold is left wanting. It didn't explain whether this number was an integer. It didn't explain whether the number could be positive or negative. It had a box to type in a maximum number, but didn't have a box to type in a minimum number. So I wasn't sure if it was expecting like zero two or one two. Didn't explain that whatsoever. Didn't really help me. Didn't have an understanding of decimals or is there like a decimal limit? Like is there as many decimals as I want? Just really didn't explain what is a number because there's lots of different types of numbers. And then for the latitude longitude, I just use this format. Just type stuff into this box and then see how it feels. See how it feels like how this could go wrong or do you have enough? Do you do you want a Z coordinate? Do you not want a Z coordinate? A Z being up or down? Yeah, that's something that I can practice on. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Rito. Homework for Rito was to come at me with some QR codes. How did it go? Word. You tell me, man. How did I do? How did I do? I sent you like five or six. We were five for six. Some of the QR codes that we reviewed were URLs. They worked great. A Twitter profile, a web page. SMS also worked. The SMS link, there's actually a lot you can do with that. You can also do stuff like this. It makes your QR code more dense, but that doesn't matter because we're going to be using redirects. So you can make the QR code as dense as you want. Personally, I always like to so the win. People click on the button. When they want to text you, they're not staring at an empty box. I do this too. So I have 4.net and then I have a button. It's like, hit me up and you click it. Subject, hello. Body is like, yo, I was at your 4.net website and I wanted to get in touch with you about. And then I, I kind of like prime them into. You do want to be aware of these features that these URIs allow. Rito also sent me a URL for an ENS that didn't work. Didn't work. So the first step is to do a payment link to a direct Ethereum address. I'd recommend trying Coinbase Wallet, whichever ones are the most popular. I forget what the order is now. So you got to check different devices when you're using anything other than a URL. Because URL just opens a browser. There's nothing fancy. But these other things are fancy. Also, Rito was talk talking about WeChat. WeChat is beyond complicated. It's literally a different internet. So I recommend we don't look at WeChat right now. And the cool thing is we can add it later because we're doing redirects. Say, say we're using the MetaMask app, right? You want to send me some crypto, uh, you type in RitoRhymes.eth. Like that's literally what you're putting in the wallet address field, and then it will effectively redirect it to the actual wallet address associated with that ENS. Okay, here's the problem. The QR code that you sent me was created by like in a text editor or in like a QR code creation thing. So that's not the approach. So you got to use something that specifically creates QR codes. For ENS is that there's, there's no, some no, no. script that needs to run. Don't worry about ENS specifically. Let's. So this one, if I click account details, I get a QR code. The question is, what is this QR code? We can actually analyze this. Ah, uh, okay. And we can go look at that QR code. I'm pulling up the ZXing uh, website. It is the way that you decode QR codes and it gives you all the raw bytes inside. It's telling me the text that is actually encoded inside the QR code. So I'm telling you how does Chrome MetaMask make QR codes, which could be different than how does Coinbase wallet on iOS make QR codes. Hopefully they should be compatible. That is something you've got to test. So basically I'm confused as hell as to why um, typing in RitoRhymes.eth, you know, that that successfully gets people to send crypto to my wallet address associated with that account. But when they scan a QR code that says RitoRhymes.eth, it doesn't process it. It doesn't effectively, you know, input those words into the into the field in the same way that I would just type out those words into the field and someone would be able to send crypto there. It does not work with the QR code for some reason. I think it's strange. So William is saying that there's an additional code that needs to be surrounding the ENS in order for the QR to scan in the app. And it's a little bit baffling why it's extra complicated, but it sounds like we're going to need to find um, something that generates a QR code for an ENS. And I can't use that generated QR for my products. I'm, I need to actually get the raw data. Yeah, I yeah, need yeah. to understand the code that is being generated behind the scenes. And he's using a technology that effectively um, reads the information inside the QR, all the subtle details. I would need to copy that and create an original QR for my products in order to be able to use it. So 
you could either go read the specification. One way to do it, the engineer way, the complete nerd way, is to just go read the specification in Japanese or whatever, and then go build your product that way. The cool way to do it is go find a QR code that works and then kind of go backwards and forwards to make another one that works. <laughs>